This creator is without a doubt one of the most wholesome and talented Minecraft builders on the YouTube scene, from immersive landscapes and structures to a Disney-inspired theme park. He's been a wizard, a mayor, a pirate, a hot guy, and an imagineer. But how does a person become all that? Was it an easy path? And after everything, what keeps him motivated? Hello everyone and welcome to Builders Research, a series where we will be analyzing the story and build style of different builders and creators. We will break down their process, style and techniques so that we can understand how they do what they do and how we can apply all that to our own creations. I took your suggestions from the last episode and decided to study good times with Scar. We will take a look at where he began and what he's been through to understand better who he is now. Today, we will together learn from Scar, the Minecraft Imagineer. To begin with this research, I decided to explore in person some of Scar's builds through the different Hermitcraft seasons, trying to pick some that I could isolate and study. But there's a problem. There were no individual builds that I could steal from their environment to analyze. They are all beautiful builds, but they are not fully complete without their surroundings. And although I found that very challenging, I was very intrigued to find out why that was the case. So I decided to go back in time. On April 19, 2011, Scar released his first Minecraft video from a series titled Super Awesome Minecraft. And to be honest, I was not expecting to find anything interesting in the very first video. However, not even a minute in, I found something that deeply caught my attention. Let's take a look. Alright, let's get started. New world name. Alright, here. Scar land. There we go. What can we make up? Ah. Huh. Disneyland. If it doesn't make Disneyland, I'll be really mad. This is in Disneyland. <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. I wonder if that younger Scar knew that he would be creating his own Disney-inspired Scarland 12 years later, and that thousands and thousands of people would love it. However, that fragment not only did not answer my first question, but also raised another one. How did he keep himself motivated during all those years until he could finally make Scarland come to life in 2023? So after searching through his content with no trace of the answer that I was looking for, I ended up finding them somewhere else. This is a fragment of his personal story shared in the Impanskis podcast. And at the end of it, he's like, I've never done this before, but when you're 18, I want you to contact my wife, who's still an Imagineer, and I want you to get a, like an apprenticeship. And it was like, <laughs> I was like, this, wow. is, this is amazing. And then, you know, at that time, like I... Like everything went into learning art and all of that stuff to be an Imagineer. And then, you know, one day I woke up and I wasn't the same. Like I had like this like crushing headache. And that's when I first got sick. Like it all started with like a headache and extreme fatigue. And then it just like snowballed from there. But during that time, like I always like held on to that dream of being an Imagineer. Like I'm going to get through this next test. I'm going to get through this next surgery, this next hospitalization. I'm going to get through this because... I have this dream and eventually like that dream just fell further and further and further apart and it kind of like crushed me in a, in a way and i had even just started a little bit of youtube at that time and then i probably went like maybe six months of being really kind of not really depressed but you know really down like mm -hmm. this probably is not going to be a reality because this is basically what i'm going to be forever and then this dream is probably not going to happen and then finally it was like an epiphany and like really like dark time that I am kind of an Imagineer. Mm -hmm. I, I do all the things that I want to do. Building Scarlet was his dream. And watching back while he was building it in Hermitcraft, we can hear him saying that. When I started YouTube in 2011, my first build was going to be what we we're going to construct as my base here in Season 9. But without seeing all this, it was hard to understand the reach and persistence of that dream. We all can relate with Scar's story in some way or another. We all at some point have crushed dreams, goals that get further and further apart from us to reach. But staying positive and making the best out of what we are given, pursuing those dreams even when they seem impossible, that's the most important lesson that Scar's been teaching us. It's finding little things that, okay, I've got these problems here, and 
but it could be much worse. And that's just kind of how I kind of stay positive. Like this and that are still working. I'm still able to make videos. I'm still able to do this. I'm still able to do that. Have things in life that you want to achieve. And uh, that really helps you. That, that has helped me the most, I think, kind of keeping goals in my mind of things that I want to do. And this disease, this tube, this wheelchair is not gonna, not gonna hold me back. But you might be wondering, what does all of this have to do with his building style? Well, now that we know a bit more about his story, goals and motivations, we can begin to really see what's going on with his creations. Back to Hermitcraft, taking a second closer look at his builds, I noticed something that at first I overlooked. Every corner, hole, interior and roof, everything is perfectly detailed. And at first I thought, okay, he likes to detail a lot, but no, it's not just that. There's a reason why Scar builds the way he does. There's a reason for why I can't simply grab one of the builds and analyze it as a standalone piece without its environment. Scar is creating the builds to be immersive. He brings to life the different places from his imagination. Scar is a Minecraft imagineer. He makes the builds to experience them himself. And I thank him for taking us with him. Now that we understand a bit more the intentions behind the SCAR builds, we are going to start analyzing them. We will break them down and see what we can learn from his style. So here we are in a new flat world where I brought the entirety of SCAR land and some of his previous season bases. To begin with the analysis, we will be creating something using SCAR's ways. And what do I mean by that? We will be making our own addition to the SCAR land park over here, trying to follow the different SCAR techniques and grabbing inspiration from his previous builds. The objective and main challenge will be to make this new Scarland addition feel like it was made by Scar himself. Now, this wouldn't be a Scar analysis if we didn't take a look at the terraforming, which is very characteristic of his style and is present in most of his builds through the different seasons. The largest and most detailed one is the one from underneath the castle, so I'll be taking this one as a reference. So if we pay close attention we can spot a few characteristics that repeat across the terrain. But to explain this is going to be easier if we start working on our own. First, we need to mark out a layout for where we want our terrain to be. And this is of the most importance, especially if you are building this entirely in survival, because it will help you visualize it before fully committing to it. One of the first characteristics that I was talking about is this sort of shagginess all around, with irregular stone and dirt spikes coming down from the top of the cliff. So, how can we get that effect? Once we have a layout, we will go underneath and roughly mark out where we want those spikes to be, pulling them out and down. Also, we can create some smaller ones behind to give it some depth. So now we'll be able to see how these shapes are going to work together. Then we have to connect this bridge to the floor and create a cliff. And here is where we find the second characteristic. I noticed that most of his terrains end with diagonals forming a triangle or a point especially in areas like this. So we are going to try and follow those shapes, adding some imperfections as we go up. At the same time, I want it to be thinner at the bottom and widen up as we move to the top. And don't worry too much if you feel like you make a mistake, that's kinda the idea. You can always step back, take a look, and fix what you don't like. Now I carved out a bigger area underneath because we need to create the beaches at the bottom of the cliff. And again, the shapes follow that sort of triangular pattern that I think works very well. So we will go around placing sand and sandstone to accentuate the cliff face. And you can use slabs and stairs to smooth the shapes. So we can see how this is starting to take shape. But now let's expand the terrain and apply the same techniques all around. There we go, I created a larger layout and we can begin to visualize a bit better how this terrain is going to flow. I even completed this small one on the side, focusing on accentuating the triangular shapes and the spikes. But now let's go ahead and fill everything in, repeating the same techniques. There we go, I even filled it with water to get a more complete look even if it's far from complete. Does it look exactly like scars? No, but it's not about copying his style block by block, but instead about taking inspiration, learning from his process and adapting it to our own individual abilities. So now we got the bottom part figured out, but we are missing the grass on top, which for what we can see has a variation of different green blocks. But let's begin for something simple and just use grass. And to be honest I believe this follows a similar pattern to what we did for the stone. 
So let's go around and create bumps of grass that stick outside and up of the stone, and then bring them down as some sort of dirt spikes, trying to go higher so we don't fully cover the stone pikes that we made before. And that's going to be mostly it. You can see how when we break it down in smaller steps or layers, it doesn't seem that hard. It does take some time though to place every lock by hand, but it's a unique look that I believe can't be achieved with commands or tools like action. Something else that I'm noticing is that in certain areas the stone goes all the way up, so we can do that to separate some of the grass chunks. Yeah, I really like the way that looks. And I'm doing this in creative mode, so I can fly around and have infinite resources, that way I speed up the process a bit more. But I'm sure these techniques will work very similarly if you want to terraform like this in survival. Now, before finishing the terrain all around, I want to see how this would look if we use one of the old glass tricks, something Scar used over here for the fountain. He used light blue glass layers with air in between, so I want to try that here instead of regular water. Of course, I will use commands for this to speed things up, and I'm making a mess. Ok, I really like the result, and we can even change the colors to see what cool effects we can get. Ok, I think I'm going with this one. It's a layer of red on top, and then all blue underneath. And finally, the last thing for the terrain is the detailing. We can use underside walls and stone stairs and slabs to polish the shapes, make them more smooth or more spiky where we see fit. And we can see how now, with all the smaller blocks, this terrain is feeling more complete. But for now, I want to move to the second step of Scar build, which is building the major structure or structures. So for this part I want to grab inspiration from the Season 7 starter base, which is the first base I ever watched him build when I first found out about Hermitcraft. But not only that, I also want to grab inspiration from Season 8, because these mechanical sort of train line machines are a very different and unique style that is present in many of his builds. So let's bring the entire base over, and we can notice here the difference in scale from them right next to Scarland. What I'm thinking is to mix the snail build with the wagon concept, and try to create our own version of a snail riding on top of a wagon. So let's see what comes out of that. Let's begin with the shell of the snail. And we could use a tool or commands to get a perfect sphere, but looking back at the episode where he built it, Scar created the sphere by hand using dirt. First, we can create a circle to figure out the diameter. Now, we can clone it and rotate it to get the edges of our sphere. If we break these blocks over here and create a smaller circle around, we can then fill this in to create a flat face on the front. And let's do the same on the back. Something like that, I think it's a good shape for the shell. Now, let's figure out how this is going to connect horizontally. I want it to be rounded, so we need to pull this further out a few more blocks. And finally, we just need to fill in one of the quarters of the sphere. I'll use another block so that we leave the frame untouched, in case we make a mistake, which we will surely do. Building the frame of a building first is a great way of building by hand, especially when we have round or complicated shapes. Now, since this is a symmetrical shape, we can use action to copy and rotate all the quarters around to save some time. With the flat face filled in, we can get some spiral built around, something like that, and use this as a guide to carve out a hole on the shell, that then we can fill in again with the glass trick, just to give it that extra magical touch. For the slug itself, we are going to grab Tuff and follow a similar process, which in retrospective is very similar to what we've done for the terraforming and for the shell. We will mark out the shape first with lines to guide us, and once we are happy with it, we build layers on top of it. Now, we can grab some deep slate and connect the slag to the shell with some sort of mechanical device. And that way, we can start including in the build the first mechanical elements from the wagon base. Using straight lines instead of curves here is a good way of separating the organic elements from the non-organic ones. And here, at the end, we can add some smoke to imprint some movement on the build. I'll add more details later on, but for now I'm just marking it out so I don't forget. And to be fair, I am really liking where this is going. The rest of the process for this build was fairly similar. Always start by marking out the frames and position of the different elements, and then work your way around filling it in, until you arrive to a full shape that you are happy with. In this case, I am taking direct inspiration from the first wagon from Season 8 for the color palette, the boat-like shape, and the wheels. And then, on top of the shell, I decided to add some houses in the same style, with pointed roof and strong overhangs. To finish off this structure, I went ahead and changed the color to dark prismarine to differentiate it a bit more from the ones Scar made. And there are two more things we need to do. First, add more glass to simulate smoke coming out of this tube. 
for which I will just follow the line, making it thicker and slowly creating a gradient that goes from black to white glass at the end. Since these are transparent blocks, you can layer the different colors and use paints to blend them better and create smoother transitions. The second and last thing we need to do is to add more texture to the roof of the snail and to the terrain below. Taking a look at Scar's texturing, something I noticed is that he doesn't go very crazy with it. We can see he uses andesite for the brighter highlights and grey concrete, cyan terracotta and tuff to accentuate the shadows in the areas that are carved deeper into the cliff. Also, he follows certain logic to place moss and mossy cobblestone close to the areas with water, where moisture would accumulate. So let's apply all that over here. Just find the areas in the terrain that you made before and paint simple shadows behind. And where we have parts of the cliff coming out, do the same with the highlights of andesite. Then we are going to add moss and mossy cobblestone close to the water, and then behind and in between the different patches of grass that we built on top to create some separation between them. Seeing how these simple changes make a huge difference in the way the terrain looks makes me realize that sometimes we don't really need to use 20 different blocks or more to texture and give personality to our bits. Sometimes it's about knowing where and why to place those color changes to get the biggest impact. And now, to add texture on the roof, I will add simple patches of moss and green terracotta, which work really well with the dark prismarine. So that's it for the structure and the texturing. Detailing is the third and last step of the way that I see a scar build. And it's the most crucial one, not only because it's the one that is going to help bring this area to life, but also because detailing is most of the times forgotten. And I'm not talking about just placing trapdoors and buttons everywhere. The way Scar details goes beyond that, and as we said before, he makes his builds as immersive as possible, and that involves not only detailing the main build, but also filling every corner so that if we walk through it, there's always something interesting to look at. This will be the toughest challenge for me because I'm not used to doing extensive detailing on my builds, so let's begin with small steps. First, I want to start by taking a look at some of his iconic tree designs. The first ones being these beautiful pine trees that he built around his season 8 base. So let's steal some of these to take a closer look. If we go ahead and remove all the leaves of these trees, we can see how he is using the tree trunk to mark out the general orientation of the tree. Then he uses fences to assist with the branch shapes and signs for detailing. I'm noticing this tendency again to go for triangular shapes, in this case at the base of the trunk. The width is approximately 6x6, so let's do that and slowly make a tree leaning over these cliff faces, first marking out the general orientation with a line, and then going back and making it thicker. Once we have an orientation and shape that we like, we can go around with fences to fill in some corners and mark out some of the branches. We will have longer and thicker branches at the bottom of the tree and smaller ones towards the top. And what we will do here to accentuate the curving of the tree is dip this side down towards the end, and the opposite side make it go up. So together they should form like a perpendicular line with the tree trunk. Then for the leaves placement you can apply a similar concept. Since we made the branches before we can follow them and fill the edges with the leaves, forming triangular shapes that dip down in the same directions as the branches. My tip here would be to be generous with the amount of leaves, and don't be afraid of placing and breaking. Now is where if we take a look from the other side it is going to look bad, so you can go back and follow the orientation that you have already determined with the other branches and create new smaller ones in the other directions, dipping down towards the side and going up towards the opposite one. So that could be the first and largest layer of leaves of our tree. Now we just need to leave a few blocks gap and repeat, but this time making shorter and smaller branches. The only difference comes when we get closer to the top. We will have very small branches, so using fences to mark them out won't really work, meaning that we will start directly with the leaves. And on the very top we can just use leaves to make a small curving line that will add that final touch of movement to the tree. You can also use a straight or a diagonal line, depending on the look that you want to achieve. That would be my way of creating trees in this style and with movement, which I think looks pretty cool. But now I will go around decorating the area with grass, leaves, moss patches and some boulders here and there, and then create a few more of these trees around so we can see how this area comes together with just some simple details all around. With this I am confident in saying that the cliffs are finished with some leaning trees that frame the build together, lots of small decorations like flowers and dirt patches around, 
and I even added a falling tree, which is the same thing as the standing ones, except that they are simpler because you just need to build one half and not worry too much about curving them. To end this project, we just need to finish this area over here. And for that, I'm thinking of taking inspiration from one of Scar's most recent builds on season 10 of Hermitcraft, which are the giant trees around his train. So what I will do is take screenshots of them from the video where Scar built them, and from that, I will do my best to break them down and recreate them here. The palette he used for this consists of orange blocks with occasional red sandstone as the brighter or more vibrant ones, and terracotta, dripstone, mud and cobblestone as the most desaturated ones. It's a great color scheme, however, I don't want to use the same palette. I want to go to the red instead of orange, so I will be using pink terracotta to transition to the red one, and then mangrove planks and wood as the dark stones. To begin with the shape, we need to mark out the size of the base, and from the pictures I can estimate them to be around 9x9. We just need to connect this around without really following any particular shape, and what we will do is to roughly mark out the height that we want first. I can't tell how tall they are, but a good rule to make them look huge is to at least double the height of the regular trees we made before. With that kind of idea settled down, we can go around filling in the shape, making sure that we make the trunk get thinner as we go up. Once we have a more solid idea of the shape that we want, we can mark out the profile first and then fill it in. At the top, where it gets to a one block thickness, we can go from blocks to walls and then to fences to give it a point determination. We can then smooth in some gaps here and there with walls and fences as well. And that's it. I think that's a good basic shape for the trunk and scale-wise it feels good in comparison. The next step is texturing, for which we will use the red palette we mentioned before. We can add some netherrack and red nether bricks to the mix to paint dark areas mostly close to the floor. We will use red and pink terracotta to create brighter spots, and mud and granite to create the saturated areas that could resemble part of the bark being weathered. Now, if we take a look at the branches from the pictures, Scar used walls and fences coming out in straight lines from the trunk and then branching out in different directions. And in concept, it's very similar to what we did for the smaller trees before. We just need to work in different layers, with larger and thicker branches at the bottom, and smaller ones with fewer ramifications as we get close to the top. Something like this could work, and as Scar said, it resembles a hairless cut, so that's a good sign. The last step is to go around placing the leaves. And similar to the previous trees, we will begin at the bottom branches and follow the shape that we made with the walls and fences. We need to make them thicker closer to the trunk and then make them thinner as we move to the edges of the branches. Again, making triangular or pointy shapes. For now, I will try not to leave any holes on the canopy so that it will cast a dense shadow close to the trunk. And we'll see why in a second. Then with patience, we just repeat the process for the different layers that we marked out with fences reducing the size as we get to the top, which should make it easier as we progress and make our way up. Once the shape is fully in place, we can texture the leaves with darker ones like spruce or birch close to the trunk, and brighter ones like oak and azalea as we move close to the edges of the leaves, and that will give it an amazing texture and a more realistic feel. And that's our mega tree done, or almost. The final step involves playing with lining. Something very interesting that Scar showcased was the simple trick of allowing the natural Minecraft light to come down on one side of the tree trunk. So now we can go, choose a spot, and go up punching a hole through the canopy. So then we can easily manipulate how far down we want that light to go by just placing or removing some blocks, which can be a leaf block or just extending a section of the trunk outwards. This is a very simple effect that makes a huge difference, so I absolutely recommend playing around with this. Now I will go ahead and finish this area with more trees like this. I got a bit carried away, but now I can finally call this build done. I added some dirt paths under the wagon similar to what Scar made. Then we have a chain here tied to the tree, so now this is telling a story with the snail trying its best to go away, but being held in place by them. And I think those small story hints are something Scar does, and it can add a lot to a build. I also created three more trees around following the exact same process, two of them are on a similar scale, and that one in the background I decided to make it taller, and I think it's my favorite one. We have some shadows here at the base of each tree, some regular tree spam to cover the edge of the forest, 
another fallen tree, some more rocks and bushes around, and to finish it off I used candles to represent birds coming out of the top of the trees, which adds so much movement and life to the build. I asked you for a name for this addition to Scarland and one of you suggested animated woodland. I imagine this being like a forest filled in with giant woodland animatronics. I have done a lot of builds in the recent years, but this one must be the one I'm most proud of, simply because I hand place mostly every single block, and if you've been around here you'd know that I love tools that allow me to build faster, like Axiom, but doing this without relying on that has helped me boost my confidence in my building skills. And that's a lesson that I want to share. Trust the different techniques and have confidence in your own skills. Tools are great, but our ability is not measured by the amount of tools or commands we know, if not by how and when we use them. As always, there's so much more to talk about from these huge creators, so I hope that from the short fragments that I selected we could learn something new together. And on that note, we are going to finish the second episode of Builder's Research. If you have any recommendations on who I should make the next research on next, please leave them down below and really take them into consideration. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, this has been Calvin and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.